All right. Well, it is noon, and so we will get started. Welcome, everyone. I'm Sarah Hanawald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development and New Programs here at One Schoolhouse, and I am really delighted to welcome Monique Devane with me. She is the head of school at the College Preparatory School in Oakland, California, or College Prep. As I, when I was checking about how to pronounce preparatory or preparatory, or so, well, we say college prep. <laughs> oh, that's great. So welcome. I've got a couple of slides that I'm gonna share with everybody, but first, will you just tell us a little bit about you and your background and how you got started on this work? Sure, Sarah, thanks so much. Um, Yes, actually, uh, admissions is sort of my first love. When I graduated from college, I stayed on at that university. So I was assistant director of admission at Brown University before switching over for a brief stint um, at the high school level as a college counselor and then switched back. So I had a number of years of um, admissions work as director of admission at North Lamont Herman and then uh, went out to the Thatcher School in Southern California and was there for nine years as their uh, director of admission and financial aid and, and assistant head. So I did a couple of things after that, some development work, and then switched over to the academic side before coming to headship. But those roots are deep, deep in the soil of admission and enrollment management. So that is so interesting. And it's an interesting path, I think, too. We could probably do a whole webinar on career paths, and you would be a great your person there. So I'm going to share our startup slides for just a minute with everyone we have some interesting answers on our Pulse question this week. And I wanna remind everyone that we will have time for questions at the end. So if you wanna pop those into the Q&A at any time and then share any resources that you have to share in the chat with your fellow participants. So on our blog, Liz Katz, our, um, Liz, Kate, I can't believe I just did that. Our assistant head of school for partnerships is has written a really interesting perspective on enrollment management and what, how academic leaders can think about that. So I would encourage reading that. And then next week's webinar, we're going to have a, an attorney as our guest, and we're going to talk about legal regulations, HR considerations for academic leaders, sort of how to stay out of the hot seat, I think, particularly useful this time of year. So this week on our Pulse, we asked, how are academic leaders involved in enrollment and admissions work at your school? And we got an array of responses. And Monique, you and I had fun looking at this as we were getting started. Um, the first thing you asked me is, you know, are they in order? And the answer is no. So I'm going to give everybody a chance to take a look at the number of things. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's not there and what surprised us. So this slide may come back and forth during our conversation this time today. Um, so there's still time to take the pulse. Sienna will put that in the chat with you. If you would like to still take this, and I'm gonna stop sharing, but like I said, I'm reserving the right to come back to this one because there is some, there are some interesting things to unpack in there. And I'm gonna stop sharing as soon as I can find the button that will let me stop sharing because like happens when you share a screen. Sorry, folks, I've got a lot going on. Two monitors, who knows what's going on where. <laughs> so, those bars disappear sometimes, those toolbars. So in this series, we've been talking about the relationship between academic leaders and other key areas of school and the partners there. And this time we're talking about enrollment management and academic leaders. So one thing that came out of our conversation was this idea that there's a distinction between enrollment management and admissions that not everybody is necessarily clear about. So Monique, could you start by just explaining the two approaches? Yeah, absolutely. Um, enrollment management as a framework or as a concept actually came out of college work that was being done in the, in the 80s and it kind of layered down into independent schools, um, uh, some more quickly than, than others. But I think we've always had admission functions. We've always recognized the need for us to be bringing in a new class. And we've thought about admissions as almost like a like a, a single year cycle. And um, lots of folks are probably familiar with the idea of a funnel, that there's sort of this funnel that goes from, from inquiries to applicants to admitted to enrolled students. And when you think about admissions, you think about that funnel kind of in a one year time frame. But when you think about enrollment management, that becomes a little more uh, multidimensional. First of all, it's sort of something that happens not in one year, it happens over many years and over many cycles. And also it, it's, it's more than just um, 
enrolling a single class out of the available pool because it has to do with the kind of tension between the different kinds of enrollment goals that you might have. You might have enrollment goals that have to do with, with numbers and those, and that's some, um, not only how many students you're looking for, but what's their distribution, what's the shape of your school, what are your entry points, and then revenue, which is always sort of like tuition times uh, number of available seats minus whatever your discounting practices are through mm -hmm. need or merit-based financial aid. So you've got some kind of revenue goals. A lot of times uh, schools focus on those hard goals of enrollment management, numbers, revenue, but there are these two other areas of enrollment management goals that kind of uh, interplay and they are the idea of quality of match and when I say quality I don't mean how good is a student you know we want a better student or worse student it's more what's the quality of the match between the individual candidate and the program as offered so we all have a sense of you know what's the target what's the shape of the student we're best um, designed to serve and so that idea of assessing quality is quality to match, quality to mission match and program match. And then composition. What is it like, uh, how does the opportunity to design and shape up a cohort, a peer group, a grade level, a whole school in a way that reflects mission? So um, total composition, you might have goals that relate to special interest areas where your school is very strong. And maybe that's academics or maybe that's athletics or maybe that's um, different sorts of understanding of um, diversity goals um, or sort of aspirations. So it, it, no one child can carry the burden of composition. That's, that's a holistic kind of thing. So if you think about those four different areas, numbers, revenue, quality of match, and composition, almost as tent poles, you can mm. start to see the relationship between them. Because if, if, if you had no vision around the particular quality, it's easier to meet your number targets. If you don't need revenue and you can make those seats free, it gets a lot easier to fill the class. So, you know, if you think about them as um, all important and in tension with each other, they're sort of like these four, four tent poles. So enrollment management is really a framework that lets you start to think about uh, not in a single cycle, what are the trade-offs you make, but um, over time, how, what are the trade-offs that you, that you're, that you're making? What are your targets? Where are you willing to give to get? And sort of how are you managing to optimize among those four different areas? Does that make sense? I really like that analogy. And, you know, as you were describing this, um, it's complicated, right? It's the difference between a jigsaw puzzle and one of those, sorry, admittedly dreadful ones that you get around the holidays where it's a 3D and it's complicated and the whole family sitting around the table kind of going, huh? Um, and yep. then that tent pole analogy is super interesting because you want the tent to be, I mean, there's so many places you can go with that. You want the tent to stay up, right? It's keeping you protected from the weather. Right. And so there's that basic, but also that idea of the different tensions make it a, a big tent, right? Everybody's there. Right. I love that. right. And I think, I think what people don't necessarily um, take time to pause and recognize is that there's actually a lot of choice. I mean, even something like the the shape, like, do you have three sections, two sections, four sections and a sixth grade entry point? What's the relationship between how hard it is to get into kindergarten and whether or not you have demand at the uh, eighth grade or ninth grade entry point? Like there's, there's actually, there are structural things that come in to an enrollment management decision that you don't have a lot of luxury on when you're in an admission cycle. When you're in an admission cycle, those decisions have been made. You've, you've stuck your tent poles in the ground and you're just doing your best. Um, but when you're thinking enrollment management, you get much more creative about, well, you know, financial aid strategy. If we give aid at this entry point, um, how does that tie it up or, or free it up to make other kinds of decisions around discounting later? So it's just, it, it's much more, enrollment management is much more design and sort of uh, proactive creation. And a lot of admission, there's a lot of creativity in that too, uh, but you're very limited um, by by expectations that are kind of baked in. Really interesting, thank you. I think that's something for academic leaders to, to take away from this and maybe ask some questions. And that 
leads into where we're headed next, which in your experience, you moved from enrollment and you got to really think about that from the college point of view, the K-12 and, and see sort of the big picture plus the local picture. And then what did you carry with you as you came into headship that helped you have insights into overall school leadership besides just knowing you know, what a reporting port point of the organization was doing. Sarah, thanks so much for that, for that good question. I think having seen the puzzle from so many different seats, the biggest thing that I brought in was this sense of a holistic view and about the importance of um, just understanding the relationship between the functional silos that you need just to practically get the work done and a more holistic and kind of integrated view. And the, the idea of like flipping the script a little bit from um, a tendency to look at the school through the eyes of those of us that love it and that are uh, internal and kind of creating the program and instead always looking at the school through the lens of student and family expectation and experience. And just knowing that from the moment a relationship starts to be built, from the moment that uh, someone returns an email or picks up the phone or says hello to the person that wanders onto your campus, you're really building a relationship. And you're, you're, you're doing that in a way that um, ideally is a metaphor for the school culture that, you, that you're trying to um, embody. And so that idea that, you know, we have great intent, we have great um, sort of sense of purpose about why we're doing what we're doing, but just knowing as an admission director, you always have this other foot in how you're experienced. That's maybe different than than what what you what you think is yeah. important, and sort of how you how, what you're trying to get done just to get through your day. So I think that that idea of just um, inside out and outside in, which I think Liz actually wrote about in her blog, really really beautifully, and that's exactly having a foot in the mythology of your school and then having a foot in the sort of market reality of your school. Uh, is always with me. Yeah. And I love the fact that you alluded to relationships because one of the things that at the very beginning of the pandemic that One Schoolhouse spent a lot of time talking about was that you could have a relationship with someone who you were teaching online and asynchronously. And I think that was uh, eye-opening for a lot of individuals. And it's something we've been talking about ever since and relationships have come up in this entire series, the relationships with business offices, the relationships with families. Peter Gow likes to call it the promise that we make families when they entrust us with, you know, something very precious to them. Yeah, yeah, and, and just that that's not a single moment, that's a dynamic set of moments. And the, the um, and this only sort of makes sense when you sort of think about it, but, but because schools are intangible, like you can, you can think you know your child, you can think you understand the school, but essentially you're taking a leap because you, it's not like you can take a nibble of it before you, you're sort of like all in, you leap all in. And, and because of that, uh, the way word of mouth operates in creating your position within a community, especially true for day schools where your geography is sort of a, a um, prescribed a little bit, you know, that, that, those word of mouth experiences actually turn out to just generate a ton of what ends up being how the community understands you. And so um, even uh, as a family's getting to know you or once they've made a commitment to you, they are always testing. They're sort of testing. This is what I thought would happen. This is what I thought the promise was. What are the experiences that are either reinforcing that or uh, running counter, like creating sort of dissonance? I remember I was at a school once where in the admission office, we put a ton of effort into creating this beautiful collateral, like lovely, glossy and pictures. And right. back in the day when we had brochures, brochures. <laughs> and then the first uh, communication that went out from the program side was this sort of like manila envelope stuffed with packets of different colored Xerox papers. And the first time I looked at that, I was like, oh dear, because the, we were creating this, this sort of dissonance. Now I know probably nobody even has packets anymore. Like what's a who sends out registration packets? But back in the, the day, purple form, you must have your purple, purple form. form. And the red form goes here, and the orange form goes there. And I, 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 uh, even in that moment, was sort of thinking like, oh, we we have to align these. Like, like we can't. This isn't like people traveling between two countries before they're admitted and after they're admitted. It it it, it has to be borderless. And so even though we have these functional areas from a family experience point of view, it has to feel the same. It has to feel continuity and it has to feel affirming of the promise that was made. Um, that's 
That's really important. Affirming and yes, you know, you're in the same place that you, that you applied to. Right. So, <laughs> I had a question then that I'd ask typically, and I'm going to change it a little bit today. So typically I say something along the lines of what do enrollment managers wish that academic leaders, um, but today I'm going to ask this. What do heads of school wish that academic leaders from assistant heads of school for academics to a division director or a department chair, what do you wish those academic leaders understood about enrollment management? You know, it's funny, I, I work at the Summer Institute that does a retreat for experienced admission directors. And um, we always ask, what do you wish your, your head knew? about the work and maybe we should ask, what do you wish your institution knew or sort of the academic leaders knew? And I think admission directors carry an enormous amount of pressure. I think they feel so beholden and so and so limited in a certain way to um, meet not only the sort of financial needs of the school. I mean, most of our schools are 80 to 100% um, tuition driven. So that burden of sort of knowing, oh my heavens, you know, I'm actually responsible for generating what turns into payroll is a lot. And um, yeah. I also think they feel a lot of tension when um, the match isn't right, when when a student doesn't uh, necessarily thrive in a school. And a lot of times schools, from an internal point of view, it's very easy when a child has a, has a let's say that they have a, the experience of attrition. It's easy to blame the child or blame the family. Oh, they just wouldn't work with us, or that wasn't, that wasn't a match. And um, very few schools have the mechanisms and the habits of trying to look at each attrition as a case study. And it's really important. Sometimes it isn't a match. And sometimes there's pressure on the admission function to bring kids in that aren't well matched. And that's its own burden to carry. Um, but but when, when a child doesn't make it, for the school, it's like an object lesson. And for the family, wow. that's that child's one seventh grade. So I think we sort of owe it to them to really be willing to unpack like, where was the mismatch? Where was the misalignment? So that idea of admission um, or academic leaders being the partner in that conversation, uh, rather than the um, you know so either person that doesn't feel responsible for that or that is kind of blaming the admission office. If only they bring us. If only they bring us the right kids, we could do our jobs, right? And so instead, being like, oh, how do we solve this puzzle together in service to families and in service to our mission? And when those things line up, it's you know that's the best feeling. Yeah, I think that's a, um, that is an ongoing conversation, right, is communication strengthens between enrollment and admissions and academic leaders. So the changes, what changes do you envision happening when that feedback loop, loop strengthens? Yeah, you know, I think, I think there's a difference between relying on interpersonal communications, like I'm a nice person, you're a nice person, we should have lunch and talk about that. <laughs> and the idea of like, a, like systemic mechanisms that actually look at what are reader ratings at the point of candidate assessment? How does that correlate or not correlate? What did we think was predictive? What was actually predictive? Like the, uh, it's not, it's not only uh, ask, ask good questions kind of deal. It's, it's like building building useful, uh, robust mechanisms to understand ourselves um, and doing that in, in sort of partnership. I don't know if that helps. You know, I think that's super important because you alluded to, hey, we're nice people, let's have lunch sometimes. And I think sometimes partnerships are invisible to maybe other people on campus. And then someone new comes into a role and everything changes and nobody understands why necessarily. Right, and we're also, we're very, most of us are quite small. Our offices may be anywhere from one to, you know, maybe five, six, seven people even, but, but um, our personalities animate our professional, you know, job descriptions so, so, so much that we get overly dependent on that. And sometimes we don't build so that the next person that comes in can just pick that baton up and kind of understand, here's where we've been over the last 10 years. Here's where we're going. You know, here's 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 what we think uh, more robust control over our enrollment variables could look like. And it really, I think sometimes also heads don't engage the academic side of the house enough in owning those questions, right? They they sort of see that as like, oh yeah, that's those admission people's jobs. 
and right. and and it's really to me it sort of starts with the head to really understand uh, how to engage um, the 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 different functional areas so that they have deeper understanding and real respect for the complexity of of what they're trying to each do. Right. And I think just scaffolding a little bit of what you do, you know, if you have a standing meeting with someone, do you, do you take notes that will be on in perpetuity beyond the, Hey, guess what? We have a standing meeting and here are the types of things that we talk about. Um, when I was new to a role, once somebody handled me, uh, here's what a year looks like in this job. Oh. That was the best gift, right? In January, here are the things that you need to worry about, even though they don't happen now. <laughs> and um, that was that was really a powerful transition tool for me. Yeah. So speaking of thinking about things ahead of time, what are questions that you're thinking about now that, you know, just what's on the horizon for you? What kinds of things are you wondering about? And you don't have to answer them. I'm just wondering what the questions are. <laughs> so many, but specific around sort of admission and enrollment. I mean, I think everyone's thinking about price and sustainability issues, you know, just the way that our cost structure is built and so tied to our staffing structure and um, wondering about the sustainability of that, particularly in this sort of high, high inflation environment. That's kind of, mm -hmm. I think, on sort of everybody's mind. I think they're really interesting conversation emerging around the role of standardized testing about how that's changing about uh it, trying to anticipate what impact that will have on us and that's both a higher ed kind of conversation because of how they're thinking about the use of standardized testing and maybe i'm very conscious of this because california and what the uc system has done but um at at uh certainly during these admission cycles during the pandemic lots of us suspended or made test, you know, went sort of test optional or suspended testing. And um, how does that impact our predictive capacities or not at all? How does that open up different channels um, for us around recruitment? I think that's kind of interesting. I think um, just compositional goals, uh, uh, many, many schools are thinking a lot about sort of equity and access and representation and how are we diversifying our, our student bodies and, um, what does that look like in an environment where um, we have limited staff and dollars to invest in reaching out to communities beyond the folks that already know about us and uh, knowing how word of mouth operates, what does it look like to get sufficient enough critical mass in a target population so that it starts to generate and replicate itself compositionally? So thinking a little bit about, about how much we're willing to invest in outreach Right. And, and what does that outreach look like? Something you and I had talked about before was yeah. so much pre-positioning, right? So you don't know a family and yet they're pretty deep into knowing a little bit about you. Well, that's, that's the whole shift. And this is, you know, once again, as someone who started admission work, when we still use the idea of leads, you know, people that you would get to know because you'd, they'd call for a, for a packet and you'd right. send the packet and then you'd have their address and, uh, you know, the invisible shopper the phenomena where people do so much deep research on you, not even directly talking to you, but looking at other websites or um, all the ways that we get rated and evaluated online these days. And so the pre-shopping uh, kind of creates an impression that then sometimes is like wind in our sails and sometimes it's something we have to overcome the other way. But yeah, it's a very different, it's a very different environment right now to be, to be um, representing our schools. Yes, and there are myriad, and and I guess one of the things is just even knowing what they are, right? Where are folks talking about the local independent schools and their experiences there, and if, um, and if tracking them is a full time job or is it something that you want to do? And and those are institutional priorities that need to be discussed, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, and 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 how do we? How do we get an accurate sense of how we're being experienced and how people are talking about us or or people aren't even talking about us you know it's a it's a funny thing in the independent school we're, world we're very likely to know more about uh, each other's independent schools than we are perhaps a public school option right down the road um, and they might know nothing about us i mean i feel as though my school here in oakland i'll very often be in a situation where I'm within a couple of miles of my campus and I'll meet someone that doesn't even know we're here, which is just like, you know, face bomb. So um, <laughs> yes, we are, we are, we're quite niche and rarely as relevant as 
we think we are to the broader communities in which we live. <laughs> That's an important humbling experience, I guess. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to our graphic that sure. we had at the beginning, because there was there were a couple of things that you said to me as we were starting to look at this that I think we might want to share with folks. And, and I'd love some perspectives if you want to offer something in the chat. Yeah. But I think one of the things that you and I expressed, um, well, we expressed some surprise, right? 96% reading files. And we thought, well, what does that mean? Yeah, I think that's I think that's interesting only because in most environments that's kind of a rinse and repeat function where we have sort of some sort of extended faculty committee that's involved in that piece of it. And um, I think you and I were just sort of talking about with some curiosity, is that is that of is that is that to compensate for small staff size? We sort of need the eyeballs, or is that because that's our way of getting buy-in? We we think if we have faculty representation in candidate evaluation that they, it somehow uh, softens that border between those functional areas and they gets more buy-in from the faculty about what the admission pool sort of looks like. Or I just think sometimes we forget to go back and ask, why are we doing this this way? Like, do we, do we need to be doing this? Right, what's the strategy there? Yeah, what's the strategy? Which can be really different, by the way, I think based on the grade level of the, of, of the students that you're evaluating. And, you know, sometimes when you're looking at, um, an evaluation or selection process for, for young kids, you really want, you're really testing for certain socialization skills and you know, you're bringing families in and the teachers are watching them and the teachers in that situation have an expertise um, around student assessment and evaluation it serves a very different purpose than maybe a, a upper school entry point where people are just at faculty or are kind of reading files and ranking or grading them. I mean, those are really different activities. Right. And then when we talk about sharing student success data, I think that's a really complicated piece. And I'm going to stop sharing again and just kind of ask you a little bit about this. But when we were talking earlier about, you know, what's predictive and test scores and what trends might be coming and thinking about a more sophisticated way to use some of that. So we're not just trying to predict can graduate, right? right will graduate successfully, especially when you're talking about pre-K admission. But what are ways that some of these assessments can help us think about our program and how we deliver on our promise and our mission? Yeah, that's such a good question. And the the and there are so many answers and it's really very context-based, the sort of school you're at, the kind of questions that you're that you're asking. I really don't think that there's a one size fits all. What I think there is, however, is a really important um, opportunity for us to look at our biases. I think when we think about student success and student success data, um, it's really easy for us to be to have blind spots um, around that. And, and I don't want to prescribe all the, what all those could be, but just invite that reflection about it. You know, why, what does success look like? Why do we think it looks that way? Um, yes. it, it's really, really easy once again to be um, kind of caught in our own mythology loop. And that's where that academic leader can say, you know, would we have some data that I may not be using as thoughtfully as I could be? So academic leaders, I'm going to charge you with having some of these conversations and thinking about what data is available where we could do some internal studies and, and look at, have we leveraged this data to deliver on our mission? And are there ways that we could deliver maybe a little bit more closely to what we describe in the, I'll say admissions process here and not the enrollment, but in our admissions process, how can we be sure that we're really tightly aligned there? Right, right, yeah. yeah. Well, Monique, I can't thank you enough. I'm really appreciative. I know that December, um, one of the joys of this particular conversation right here has been watching the students behind you as they come back and forth. I know there's so much going on campus. <laughs> this time of year. So thank you for giving us a half hour. I'm really grateful. Absolutely. Thank you. It's, 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 it's a pleasure. And um, it's just one of the most fun parts of school life because it's where we really create ourselves, right? And when we're, when we're doing admissions, we're selecting our alumni base, which is not a fun <laughs> way to think about it. <laughs> so as you look at that five-year-old, you think, okay, what will you be like at 35 when you're bringing your five-year-old? <laughs> exactly. So thank you for having me. It's a great conversation.
Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.